we'll go back to just being in person, so it won't be a problem. So I just want to um, welcome everybody to our um, fantastic program tonight. I'm excited for it myself, even though I'm a Kerry woman, of course, but we have friends in Monaghan. Um, <laughs> writer Ray McKenna is going to discuss uh, the great hunger exodus from uh, from Monaghan and oh yeah in County Tyrone. Okay, good. So we're we're on live now on on YouTube. So that's one of the problems solved. Uh, so writer will writer Ray McKenna will discuss his ancestors and other refugees basically who fled Monaghan and Tyrone during the Great Hunger. As if the loss of the potato crop was not enough, there was also secular violence inflaming that region during the same month. While men and women from every county in Ireland poured into Providence, Rhode Island during the famine years, between a third and one half of those people actually originated from close to the border between Monaghan and Tyrone. And it actually began a chain of migration to Providence, which fundamentally altered both the communities that they were leaving and the new ones they embraced in Rhode Island. So this is a very intimate examination of how a community that's absolutely sundered by famine and immigration uh, sets up a new community elsewhere through the very personal experiences of his own friends and their relatives and, and family. So thank you very much, Ray. I'm going to hand it over to you and you can share your screen now and I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> okay. Well, here I go. Hello, people. Can you see me? Are we there? Oh, we no. You, we can't see your, your PowerPoint yet. You can see my PowerPoint. Can no, you see can't. me? We can't see your PowerPoint. Can you see me? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit. Um, no, we can't see the PowerPoint, Ray. Okay. So you have to share. You can or can't? We can't. Oh. Oh, man. We did a practice today, everyone, and it went perfect. <laughs> 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 I just want that out there. <laughs> Okay, so I'm no. going to share the screen. Yeah. Oh, uh, whoops, wait a minute. No, oh, damn it. Sorry. <laughs> I know it's awkward because there's all the tabs. <clears throat> it's the thing I hate most in life is messing up like this. Okay, so I'm sharing the screen. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to. And I get to... to give you loads of options and you just pick the PowerPoint. Be perfect, yeah. Okay. So nah. make your oh, there PowerPoint, we are. but make the took, PowerPoint, yes, perfect. Okay. It took a wee bit of effort, but there we are. Yeah, so, so now <coughs> I'm going to highlight you, Ray, for everybody, and I'm going to mute myself, okay? Okie doke. So the story starts um, with, what's the host of Spotlight? Are we okay? Oh, okay, sorry. So the story starts, as it does for many Irish Americans, not knowing where you came from. I grew up uh, in a household in Rhode Island, knowing that I was mostly Irish. My mom tried to tell me that I was a bit of a mutt, that I was a little of this and a little of that. But as I eventually began to dig, I began to realize that I was a lot of Irish and more Irish and then some Irish after that. And it took a long time to come back to this place called Emmyvale. And this is where my family started out to head to Providence, Rhode Island in 1846. And this is where um, I'll be talking about. The, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people went to Providence, Rhode Island during the famine. Um, it's a very wide open number, and I apologize. I have a friend who's a very good historian, um, Father uh, Robert Heyman, who has been working on the numbers very, very hard. Um, but it seems that um, that's that's fairly accurate. Somewhere between five, between ten and twenty. Now, a third to a half of those people came from this area. This area is in the north of uh, the Republic. As you can see from the map, it is uh, right. It juts like an arrowhead into Northern Ireland. Um, it is a very dangerous place today, even though there is peace. Um, it's all under the surface. And it's been a very dangerous place for um, quite a few centuries. It is also the home of 
uh, Mechanic Land, and you can see this book right here, which is called uh, Emmy Vale, Mechanic Country, written by Seamus McCluskey. And um, it's really uh, our uh, clan owned this area that's called Ergal True, you can see it in Donna. That was all part of the Barony of True. And today, if you go there and you ask somebody if they're a McKenna, they'll go, of course, I'm a McKenna. It's very hard to uh, trace your family if you come from here and your name's McKenna. Anyway, um, in the corner, you can see John, uh, Archbishop John Hughes, which is the, he was the first Archbishop of New York. He's probably the most famous person in our clan. Um, both, he had two grandmothers named McKenna. Um, there might have been a third one named McKenna. We're not sure, but um, he had two, two grandparents. Um, one set of grandparents came from uh, two miles or a mile or two east of where my family came from, and the other set came from a mile or two to the west of where I come from. So uh, it was a very tight-knit group of people. So why do they come to Providence? This is uh, a digitized version of a screen drop that uh, the Rhode Island Historical Society owns. This is how the city looked, or the town, I should say, looked about the year of 1810. Um, it was a, a town of maybe 10,000 people. It was a town that was based on shipping. They shipped to uh, back and forth to Europe, to Africa. <laughs> they were involved in the slave trade. They shipped to the Caribbean, and they shipped up and down the coast, the coast. Um, but there was something else that was going on at the time, and it, it fed into why people from Monaghan and from Tyrone came to the city. In 1791, an Englishman named Samuel Slater uh, was enticed to come to Pawtucket, which is six miles outside of Providence, to set up the first integrated, uh, <coughs> I shouldn't actually say an integrated, the first uh, textile uh, mill in the United States was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. His mill could turn uh, the fiber into, um, into string, but it, they didn't have weavers. They, didn't, they, couldn't, they had no weaving machines. And so he needed to recruit weavers. And a year later, within a year, he had recruited Thomas Robinson from County Armagh, right next to Monaghan, to come over to be a weaver. And um, Robinson, in turn, recruited other people from South Ulster to come over to uh, work for Samuel Slater. They became good friends. Uh, they had a very close family relationship. And I don't know if this is the beginning of the chain migration, but it, it's indicative of what was to come. So meanwhile, back here in Monaghan and Tyrone, on the border, with uh, between the plantations of uh, the English and the Scots and um, Catholic uh, Ireland. Uh, it was a very hot spot. There was violence going on all during the 1700s. In the early 1800s, there are a lot of uh, famous fights that happened. One of them is the fair at Emmy Vale in 1815. Um, in which um, pretty much, uh, I would say that from what I read, mostly it started out with Protestants attacking Catholics for being, um, for being Catholic. So in 1795, 15 miles away from where my family lived, the Orange Order was established in County Armagh. At the same time, it was said by uh, the historian McCluskey, who saw his book, that in 1795, the United Irishmen were, had overwhelming support in County Monaghan. The United Irishmen, of course, were the ones that wanted to have an independent Ireland. They were made up of both Protestants and Catholics, and what they really wanted was their independence. Two years prior to this, my grandfather, my, my third great-grandfather, James Dugan, was, was born. Five, uh, in uh, A couple of years after that, his wife, Ellen McKenna, um, who was also my third great-grandmother, was born. You're going to see the name McKenna a lot. Uh, it just shows up. It's a clan. So in 1797, two years after the creation of the Orange Order, there's a lot of tension in Ireland, and the British government, the English government, decides that they should pull up militias, have militias in every county of Ireland, but they don't trust them. And so they take, for example, the Monaghan militia and they move it to Belfast. 
change. They don't want the militias at, in their home counties. And there's a good reason because a lot of the militias were very, very favorable to the United Irishmen. So a, um, a spy reported that seven of the men in the, in the Monaghan militia were actually um, members of the United Irishmen. And they confronted those people and three of them confessed and four men, boys, Owen McKenna, Billy McKenna, Peter McCarran, and Jimmy Gillen would not, would not um, uh, say anything bad against the United Irishmen. They said they were part of the United Irishmen. They, they would not, they would have been saved, but they would not um, confess. Owen McKenna, who grew up, who was the father, and he lived two miles away from my family, he went out to see them in, in Belfast. And he said, I cannot bear to see my sons die, but not to live as traitors as slaves in the land of their birth. He was, he told the boys, they didn't need to be told, but he told them, uh, give up your lives for free Ireland. So my family members grew up knowing about Owen and Billy McKenna. They may have been family friends, but they knew about them. And all of Ireland knew about these great heroes early on. So this is the village of Glennon. Glennon is about five miles away from Dernalasset, where my family lived. Um, and it's a very unusual painting. It's a very rare painting from 1771. And it gives you a little sense of the, the countryside. Even today, it is very rural. You can see the hill in the background. That's very typical. They talk about the little hills of Monaghan. Um, a lot of those hills on the tops of them are what they call Danish forts. I've been up on some of these and they have uh, earthen works where you can see that they, they uh, built fortresses. So when the Vikings came down the river, they would be prepared to protect themselves. In the right hand corner up at the top, you can see the 1826 tithe allotment where James Dugan, my ancestor, um, was renting six acres. He also re um, rented another three acres in another village nearby another townland, I should say. And in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a um, baptism recording of one of uh, James and Ellen's children. Now, the area is still very rural today. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any photographs from the 1840s and 1850s. Um, you won't see them in Providence either, so I have to rely on the early 20th century or the late 19th century. But there was a woman named Rose, um, Rose Shaw, and she came to work as a nanny in just over the border in Clara in, in County Tyrone. And she loved taking photographs. And these are photographs of people that she knew, that she met. And you'll see that a lot of them, the, the, a lot of the times the people are, are barefoot. They're living a very simple life. This is 60 years or more after the famine, but it's still not that different. Um, the fellow in the center, he had relatives. His name was Holland, and he had relatives who went to Providence. And the left-hand side, the fellow with the accordion, also had relatives that came to Providence. It was a very intimate relationship. So the famine comes. It hits, as we all know, in the fall of 18, uh, 1845. And the following spring, as people are suffering, they're, they're hungry, they're desperate, they don't have money to buy food. Um, I discovered about maybe two months ago, the dialogue that took place at a meeting of the landlords for the north of Monaghan and the south of Tyrone. The sheriff of Monaghan pulled these people together. So we're having a meeting at the... Um, uh, headquarters right in the center of the uh, law courts, right in the center of Monaghan. You can see there's the power in the um, in the, the, the image of the British government right up top. And he said to them, we're the best judges of what our tenants need. So Thomas Ankatil, who was one of the uh, landlords, said the potatoes are abundant and sound. In fact, on market day, Farmers would load up their, their wagons with potatoes and other goods, bring them to the market, but people didn't have the money to buy them. 
my family included, couldn't buy the, the product. And so it was suggested by Thomas Ankatil also, maybe public works were the answer. We'll make them work more. Well, these people were already working and they were hungry. They needed immediate attention. Finally, after a couple of hours of discussion, uh, the Sheriff of Monaghan said, we should adjourn until the period arrives, if it arrives at all, when our interference is necessary. We can call a meeting, we'll form a committee. So they saw the danger coming, they saw the people suffering, and they said, we're not doing anything. So four days before that meeting, a ship arrived in New York. It was called the Shenanga. It had been at sea for 49 days. It had several hundred Irish immigrants on it. 88 of them were en route to Providence. And they were people coming out of mostly County Tyrone and some from County Monaghan. On, they were lucky, there were no deaths, there were three births. Now, if you look at the, the list of people here, you see Bernard McKenna and Mary McKenna. They were very lucky, they were able to bring a bunch of their kids with them. And their little boy, Barney, was born. He was born a couple of weeks out before they got into New York. I can't imagine what it must have been like for her to go through all that time being pregnant and then having a new baby. And not only did she have a new baby, but she had a little boy named Lawrence, named was three years old that she had to take care of. It was, it was a brutal, brutal situation. So they come to New York, or they come, I'm sorry, they come to Providence. They, they arrive in New York, they come to Providence. This is Providence in 1835 on the top. It is becoming more industrial by 1849 on the left-hand side. And in 1858, uh, six years after the end of the, the famine, it is um, quite an industrial city. Now, if you look at the, uh, I'm going to move this a little bit. If you look at the population growth, you'll see that between 1840 and 1850, the population grew by only almost 20,000. It grew by 80%. Most of that was Irish or the children of Irish immigrants. And close to a third, I would say, you could say a third of those people came from Monaghan, Tyrone, Armagh, and Fermanagh, but mostly in Monaghan and Tyrone. So uh, my family came, uh, my Dugans came first. Uh, uh, James came in 1846 to 47. He came with his two oldest kids. They saved their money, they sent back, and Catherine or Ellen came with the remaining children in 1848. In 1852, um, their daughter Catherine, who had saved a lot of the money, and she paid a lot of the money that allowed the family to come over because she worked as a domestic servant. Domestic servants had several advantages. One was they were fairly well paid and they didn't have to pay room and, and board. So her money went to bring over um, Ellen and the other people. And she also met a fellow named Patrick McKenna, Peter McKenna. Peter had the same name as his mother-in-law. Peter McKenna and Catherine Dugan, they got married on July 4th, 1852. This was incidentally the same day as Frederick Douglass, the great black liberator, that he made his most famous speech condemning slavery in America. But back in Providence, the two uh, lovers um, got married. It was on the 4th. The next day was a holiday. <coughs> and so all of the sea, all of the, the, uh, the, the port and all of the bay were filled with pleasure ships as they partied all day long. So where they moved to, they moved to Federal Hill. Now, one of the benefits for me um, doing research and getting it out to the public is that Federal Hill is probably the most famous neighborhood in all of Rhode Island. Um, it's notorious for being the headquarters of the New England Mafia um, for most, most of the 20th century. Um, it started out as an Irish neighborhood. It became an Italian neighborhood. It's still famous for its Italian restaurants. Uh, it was my job to go and then demonstrate to people in Rhode Island and elsewhere that, in fact, it was an Irish neighborhood. Even more than that, it was an Ulster, little Ulster. 
nothing against the rest of the, the rest of Ireland. I've got ancestors from Roscommon and from Mayo and other places, but uh, most of the people who lived up here uh, were, were from um, from Monaghan and Tyrone. Well, incidentally, you can, if you look, and I don't know if you can see my pointer, but this house was the house that my family lived in, and they shared a rather large outhouse with a couple of other families. It was pretty, pretty brutal. In 1865, there were 20 people living in two apartments, in, uh, and I think it made up five families in, in, with my family. So these are names that you'll find in Ireland. Um, some of them are not exclusive to South, South Tyrone and North Monaghan, but a lot of them are. And you would have found most of these, you would have found all of these names in Providence in 1860 or 1870. You would have found most of them on Federal Hill. And if you look, you'll recognize, I know you'll recognize a lot of names there. So they needed work. As soon as they arrived, they needed to go to work. Uh, there were some brothers named Carol who came from Monaghan and they, they um, landed in a small village just south of the city. And in their naturalization documents, they said that as soon as they arrived, they were teenagers, like 15 years old, but as soon as they arrived, not a week later, as soon as they arrived, they went to work in factories. Um, the factory in the upper left-hand corner is, was known as the Calendaring Company. It's the Providence Dying Bleaching and Calendaring Company, but everybody called it a calendaring company. And in 1827, they recruited a man named John McKenna from County Armagh. He was a skilled textile worker. He was, um, he knew the machinery that they had, they'd recently bought new machinery. He knew the machinery, he knew how to work it, he knew how to repair it. And he also was a good manager of people. So he became the manager of that, that plant. And he was typical of a lot of people coming out of South Ulster in that they had textile experience. And that was the key. Um, in Ireland at this time, the textile centers were in Ulster, mostly Eastern and Southern Ulster, and also in a little bit in the Dublin area. And so John McKenna comes from County Armagh and he begins to bring in more people from County Armagh, from Monaghan, from Tyrone, uh, because he knows these people and they have skilled textile works, um, skills. Most of the people living in Southern Ulster did textile work after they did farm work. They had spinning machines, um, spinning wheels, and they had um, um, weaving machines. I just lost the word at home. And so, so there was a lot of skill to, to be offered. Um, Philip Allen, the fellow in the lower left-hand side, was um, became the governor of, of Providence. He, he ran a print works where he, he made uh, beautiful um, uh, block printing. And he had over 250 people working for him. Most of 250 people, Irish people working for him. And just like the calendaring company, he hired Irish people as managers, which was quite unusual. Now, my great great grandfather, who was the um, son in law of the Dugans, he worked in this building on the right hand side, which was the New England Butt Company. The painting in the center was painted in 1886 inside that building. And if he could be here now to see that painting, he would probably recognize some of the people in that, in that painting. So really it's, it's an extraordinary document for uh, Rhode Island, for Providence, for the Irish, and for, my, for me, for my family. So if you weren't working for one of the big companies, you worked for, you created your own business. And so uh, Thomas Monaghan was uh, uh, from Monaghan. Uh, Francis Hackett was from uh, Tyrone. Mike McKenna had a plaster works downtown, um, but lived on the hill. These were people, Sullivan, Sullivan was a Southern boy. He was down near Kerry where Elizabeth comes from. I think the, the Sullivans are mostly out of Cork, if I, if I have that correct. Uh, but a lot, there were a lot of small businesses up on the hill. The big problem, the biggest problem that they faced was that um, the children that came over suffered terribly. Um, even before the famine, 
um, people would come over on ships, their um, children's parents would die. Um, they lived in tight, tight quarters. There'd be a lot of fighting going on in the families. Um, children were abused, they were beaten up. And so by 1839, the Irish community in Providence had created the Hibernian Orphan Society. Um, there was another society, which was a um, mostly Protestant, but it was a um, non-denominational, and that was a children's friend society. And they, they also took in Irish kids. Um, my own great-grandfather, Patrick, uh, son of Peter and Catherine McKenna, um, went to work when he was nine years old in a factory. And I've got lots of stories that if you go to my blog, you'll find out about people losing limbs and losing their lives. It was, it was a very, very tough thing. One, there were a couple of ways to deal with them. Um, you could take in some of these kids and try to uh, um, farm them out to farms or to, to factories, and they would be indentured. Um, we think that term was from the 18th century, but they were still indenturing for people. Um, but the hardcore ended up in places like the Providence Reform School. And if you were to take a look at that, if, you, if we knew the names of those people there, I would gather that 60% of them were Irish. The Irish were creating crime far more than the Yankees were because they were in such desperate, desperate situation. Um, I was in the Providence archives one day. I was going through these papers. They've been folded up and put away. Um, like th this particular one was 1849. They had taken the document and they had folded it and made it into a little block like that. And they put it away and it never was opened up again until 10 years ago, maybe. And um, the archives, they got a machine that would take the, take the paper and slowly open it up because it was so dry and would just fall apart otherwise. And I came across a story now, this girl is not the same girl I'm going to tell you about. This is Evelyn Casey, who came from Fall River, Mass., which is eight miles from Providence. Um, and she's 14. She had a hard life. I'm going to tell you about Katie Conley. Katie Conley was an 11-year-old girl. And one night in October, it was a cold, miserable night. The wind was blowing. It was a north nor'easter. And there was this fellow named Walter Danforth. And he heard a knock, knock, knock on his, on his front door. And he went to the door and here was a little girl without a bonnet, without shoes, without much in the way of clothing. And she was crying. And he said, what can I do for you? And she said, I, I want to see my aunt. Her aunt was working as a domestic servant. She was living with the Danforths. Well, Danforth brought her in. Mrs. Danforth gave her a hot bath, dressed her in warm clothes, and Walter wrote to the city, um, city council and said, can we do something with this girl? Can we send her to the children's uh, friends uh, society? Can, can they help them out? This is a terrible, terrible situation. Well, the children's friends took her in, and I was lucky enough to also discover the children's friend, which is still around, have the records from this time. So what you see on the top is his letter to the city council to, for her to get help. And what you see on the bottom is a, um, the evaluation that the people, that the, the children's the friend society said. And it says, Katie is a wicked, naughty girl, uh, dishonest and a great rambler. She goes off on her own all the time. She runs away. They're trying to get her put into the reform school. It was really, really sad. I was, I was, you know, you, you, you find these stories and you feel, you feel for these people and you just hope that turn, things turn out. But they couldn't turn out well for everybody. Um, two other kids that I, I, I don't know how it turned out, but there were two little girls. They were three and five years old. Um, and they were found in the woods up on Federal Hill. And uh, a teacher came by. They were going out during the daytime and begging. They were three and five years old. They'd go out and beg during the daytime and then live in the woods at night. And they were brought to the, the Children's Friends Society and they were taken care of. And, and I have a story about them in my, in my blog.
whoops, sorry. Uh, in the same neighborhood where people were raising their kids, trying to make things good, there was a lot of violence. There were, there were a lot of illegal things going on. Um, a woman named Catherine Hamilton, Hamilton being a very Ulster name as well as a Scottish name. She was probably uh, part of the Ulster community. She opened up a, a, a house of pr prostitution up on the hill. She was right down the, the street from uh, uh, Hackett's um, pig farm um, and not too far away from some of the other, uh, a lot of the houses. And so this is a really a mysterious kind of thing because um, I looked for records in the Providence Journal, which was the, the journal of record, the, the newspaper of record, and I could find nothing about her. I found nothing about her other than stuck in these, these documents or hidden away was a story of Catherine Hamilton. Well, they sent out a series of policemen, watchmen they were called, and they would go to her house and they would record that, yes, there are all these uh, carriages coming and going. And, uh, something's going on, but we don't know what's going on. We're just, we're innocent. And I think that what it was, was that the powers that be, some of the most important men in the city were going to Catherine Hamilton's at nighttime and the police were trying to get her thrown out of town, but being very careful that no one's names were mentioned. She was eventually um, thrown out of town. Um, she was, uh, this is her document on the, on the left-hand side is they're asking her to come to, to appear. And on the right-hand side, they're saying that she is, uh, can no longer live in the city. And then there's this fellow. This fellow, uh, uh, James Donnelly shows up in 1854. Now 1854 is a very famous um, year, very influential year. It was the year of cholera. It was a big breakout. There'd been many breakouts, but 1854 was significant. Um, it hit the Irish community the hardest. They lived closest to the rivers and to the port, and that's where the disease fed. Um, it was also the year of the Know Nothings when they took over the state government, not only in Rhode Island, but in other places, and they wanted to push the Irish Catholics out of the, out of the community. He was very upset. Um, he came there to, um, he, he became the Bishop of Clo Clara. So he was the Bishop eventually over this whole area of Monaghan and Tyrone. Um, but when he came in 1854, he was a young man. He was asked to come and raise money for the new university that was going to be in Dublin that would educate Catholics. And so because there were so many people from his area, he spent several months in Providence um, observing the town, but also collecting money from my relatives and their friends. Um, he said it was a very fine, fine city. He was, uh, thought it was very clean and very Yankee. Yankee dumb, Yankee dumb, Yankee dumb in earnest, he's called it. Um, but he was very upset with, as you can see in the middle there, the, the, the depiction of Irish people as being um, dirty and being... Um, monkeys and being terrible. But at the same time, he was very critical of the Irish community because um, they believed in banshees. When, when people died um, and they had funeral services that would go through the town, it was a, over a mile away to the, the cemetery. And during this whole time, there'd be women keening at the back of the, the, um, the entourage. And he said, all of these things are terrible because it's gonna make people think that we're different and that we're not, not right. And so basically what he wanted, he wanted us, he wanted, our, he wanted our people to be just proper Yankees. So it was a real mixed bag. He also, his diary, I've got a copy of his diary here, thanks to the Clara Historical Society. And in his diary, he talks about meeting individuals from Monaghan, from Tyrone, and talks a little bit about their lives. It's a great resource. So 1861 comes, um, the, Irish are, um, the Irish growth, it, it slowed during the 1850s, um, but there were many, many Irish people, probably 20,000 Irish people and their descendants living in the city um, by 1860, maybe more. And a lot of the young men, thousands of young men go off to fight. Now, John Sheridan, young man from County Tyrone, 
he fought for the for Rhode Island's uh, first cavalry, and you can see this photograph. Look at the emptiness in his eyes. He had been captured prior to this. He had been um, going to a prisoner of war camp in Virginia. He had gotten his release and he came home. Look at that belt around him. He is, he's, he's thin, he's emaciated. His eyes look dead. He came home, he married his, his sweetheart and he signed up again and he went back into battle and in um, a skirmish in which nobody else was hurt, he was shot in the kneecap and from that kneecap he bled, but then he got infected and he was dead. Another, another person also from County Tyrone was John McKenna. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see the stone in um, St. Patrick's Cemetery for his father, Owen. His father, Owen, died just a couple of years before he did. Um, the lower right-hand side, you can see a photograph from the time of the prisoners at, at uh, Andersonville. The left-hand side, you can see the, the markers. There's John McKenna's marker, the unmarked grave. There were mass burials. And the upper left-hand corner, that is a picture that I took a couple of years ago at Andersonville. It's a big rolling area that was wide open, surrounded by a palisade. Um, that stream went through, the, through there and it was jammed with thousands of poor kids. They didn't have tents or they made tents out of their clothing. They had very little, they were robbed of everything before they were put in there. And so they spent a lot of time under the sun or under the rain exposed to the elements. They were poorly fed, food was thrown at them. When sometimes when they got so thirsty, they would go over to the stream and they would drink water from the stream. But in fact, um, Confederate uh, guards were spoiling the stream up, upstream, they were, they were uh, defecating in it. And so the boys that would get so thirsty and drink out of that stream would get sick and died. And that's what happened with John. John died of dysentery. Um, it was a horrible, horrible thing, terrible thing. So his poor mother, Bridget, um, was left with, as a, without a husband. She was left with a son who knew, couldn't even come, whose body couldn't even come home. Um, it was a very, very hard life for them. And it wasn't just them. There were many, many people in Federal Hill or many people throughout the United States who suffered that way. But the war came to an end and it gave um, Irish people a little bit of an opportunity. So people began to, um, again, still by having their own businesses, began to grow those businesses. I love this photograph I found of, um, this is Mark Golrick. You can see him, he's standing there. He's a short guy standing in front of his, his store. That is a man who's proud of his, his company. So he, his family came from uh, Roscommon and they created a business right up in Federal Hill. It was also the beginning of a time when Irish people were being accepted a little bit more in Rhode Island community. So Patrick Egan, who had served with the Rhode Island Volunteers, prior to the war, he would not have been allowed to be a policeman. Um, they wouldn't hire Irish people. After the war, he became not only a, a policeman, but he rose to become chief of police. There was success. William Gilbane opened up a business um, doing car carpenter work. And in fact, today, Gilbane is one of the biggest industrial builders in the world. They build massive things all over the place, um, still headquartered in Rhode Island. Um, Patrick McCarthy, who was born in County Sligo, became the mayor of Providence, the first Irish mayor and the only immigrant to become a mayor in the history of the city. And we all know George from Cohan from his music. He grew up on Corky Hill. But it wasn't all fun and games. And for most people, it was a pretty horrible thing. So you have um, Mary McLaughlin, her upper right hand corner. She was born Hoban in County Mayo. And that's her, her two daughters. On the left hand side standing up is Sarah McLaughlin, who is my great grandmother. Well, Mary married a fellow named Barney McKenna, Barney McLaughlin. And they had a really tough time of it. Um, 
he was a good money maker. She banked the money. That's the, the, this uh, image in the middle here is when she opened a bank account. And that's how I know she was born in County Mayo because there it is. It says Mary McLaughlin, X means I can't write, I'm illiterate. Born in County Mayo, lives in Oneyville, wife of Barney, operative of Taft and Wiegand. And I happen to know that Barney was working at Taft and Wiegand, so I have no question that that is my, that is Mary, that's my Mary. Um, he began to um, abuse her, he began to beat her. And um, finally she, she uh, filed for divorce. And I was able to get the documents, and it's so sad, I've, I've got documents, copies of documents that have my great grandmother, my dad's grandmother, describing Barney beating her mom. A really, really sad thing. Um, I can't uh, defend him. I don't know what happened, but I know that there was a lot, a lot of pressure that all these immigrants were under. They had all come out. They, uh, both Mary and Barney, had come out of the uh, the famine. They'd come in really tough situations. They'd lived in crowded situations. So shortly after um, he got divorced, he rented a place. He worked for a few years and he put a lot of money back together. So he wasn't, I don't think he was a drinker because he, 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 when he died, he had almost $1,000 banked. Um, he died in, by stepping in front of the uh, Stonington Railroad, the Stonington train. One night it was at uh, sunset and the train was coming around the corner and he laid down and I've got the best description of any of my ancestors from the um, train report that he was probably about five foot eight or five foot nine, light skin, black hair, blue eyes, looked young for his age and his body was spread out over a couple hundred yards. It was really, sometimes you find these things in your family and it's pretty gruesome. Got another another branch. This is my Ross Common branch, um, and um, Ellen or Nellie Gilrow is on the left hand side. That's my um, great great grandmother on my mother's side, and that's her um, her sister Katie on the right. Um, Ellen was most likely born in the house in the upper left. It's the house in Barnhill. Um, her father was uh, Frank Stroker. He was well to do. He didn't own his land, but he 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 leased. 151 acres from an ancestor of Tom Cruise. So um, to be able to have 151 acres is a, a really good thing. But um, his wife died in childbirth with Ellen. And so Ellen was sent to another family. And I this building on the left hand on the right hand side is another one of the family households. I've been, I've been inside both of these. And I think that Ellen was probably raised there. But when she was a teenager, she fell in love with a man who worked for, for her father. And her father didn't approve, and her father disowned her. So she and her husband, Patrick, moved to uh, England for a little while, to Manchester. Then they moved back to County Roscommon. He was having a hard time getting work. Um, he left the family to come to America to find a job and to send money home. And I found a newspaper account where um, Ellen took her four children and moved into the building in the middle down below. She went to the workhouse in Roscommon and asked to have to be taken in. That's about as low as you can be in your life. Um, eventually, she and the children made it to a little town outside of Providence called Burrowville. Don't know what happened to her husband. He, he may have died, he may have run off. We don't, it's not known. Um, but when her daughter, my great-grandmother died in the, in the newspaper, she put down that she was a native of Manchester, England. I grew up thinking that my family was English because she hated so much what had happened to her as um, a young girl by her father. Um, that they, they denounce their Irishness. Now, getting back to Federal Hill. Here's 1915, here's Mike Halloran. They're still on Federal Hill, it's become a little Italy, but there's still a big Irish neighborhood. My family who moved there in the 1840s was still living on Federal Hill in 1920, 1921. 
but it was changing. It was becoming an, an Italian neighborhood. Um, there's still a lot of Italian there. Um, Acorn, Acorn Street in 1903, that picture in the lower left. Um, my family lived on that street in 1903. And here we are at the early 20th century in uh, Federal Hill. And then you ask what's left. Well, these, these pilings are where the port of Providence, one of the ports, one of the sections of the port of Providence um, was. Um, people and goods came in and out of the city right here. And now these pilings sit there like ghosts. And up on Federal Hill, you have a, a Trainer Street, which is really a back alley. Trainer, along with McKenna, was the other big historic name in County Monaghan. And McAvoy, Thomas McAvoy, owned the whole block where his name still is there. Um, there's a fine Italian restaurant in the house that he, he built and lived in. And there is the cemetery. The Cemetery St. Patrick's is an amazing place because, you know, in the famine cemeteries, they put down where they came from. They put down their county. Sometimes they put down their, their townland um, and they told stories. And this is the stone of James and Ellen McKenna and their son, Patrick, who died just a year or two after arriving in America, tuberculosis. But there are happy things too, because in 2011, my dad, my son and I went back to County Monaghan and here are um, Dan and dad walking on the farm that our, our ancestors, um, James Dugan farmed. And there's my dad talking with uh, Francie Dugan McKenna. Um, at the time, I think Francie was 91 and dad was 88. Um, Francie died shortly thereafter. He went out one day, he tended to fences a few miles away on one of his, one of his properties. He came home, he put the potatoes on the pot and he sat down in his most comfortable chair and fell asleep and went away very nicely. And my dad lived to be 95. And for the people in, oh, here's some more of Derna Lawson. Uh, Patty McQuaid is a good friend. This is my dad and Patty's wife, Bridget. Bridget is my cousin. Um, in the lower corner, you've got a picture of dad with Willie McKenna, who took us around, Willie the Hill McKenna, and also Philomena McKenna in the center. Philomena and dad, the cousins. They could have grown up together, except there were a few generations. And then for the people in Ross Common with that, the family of John's, of um, Frank Stroka, who disowned his daughter and sent her away. Well, these are Frank's descendants. These are my cousins. They kept the farm. Um, Jerry uh, Kelly still farms the same 151 acres that Frank Stroker, my third great grandfather did back in 1851. Um, I'm gonna see them this summer. Um, we're gonna see, I'm gonna see several generations of their family, just like I'm gonna see people in County Monaghan this summer and bicycle on those little hills of, of Monaghan. And I want to thank you. Um, I hope I've been um, helpful to you. Um, I'll leave you if you want to know more about uh, the situation with the Irish in Providence. I have federalhillirish.com. And I have lots and lots of stories. They, they are specific to Providence, but they're, um, they tell a general story about what happened in, to the Irish. Well, I thank you. Um. Sorry, Ray, that was amazing. Thank you. I'm just um, trying to unmute myself. And if you stop sharing your screen now, they can see you, you know, properly for the questions and answers. Uh, just in the share screen, hit stop share. Ah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, stop. Like, so hover over yourself on Zoom. Um, no, okay, hang on. I might be able to do it. Uh, can you do it? <laughs> I'm not sure if I can, but <laughs> um, <laughs> because um, like it's your screen. So when you're in the Zoom screen, yeah, it should come up like share screen and then don't. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> okay, share screen, don't share screen. Yeah, perfect. Stop share, I think it says. Can you see that? Nope. 
Okay. I do not see it. Uh, hang on, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I, I can't stop it because you were the co-host, so you, you have to stop it yourself. Anyway, sorry, guys. Oh, my, so I'm just so sorry about this. So screen saving, that's okay. Um, so, anyway, um, do you have oh, anyone have questions? You're sharing your screen, like, so we're going to be looking at it. Um, I'm so sorry. That's okay, we're fine. Um, so the Irish American, somebody asked, is this recorded? And I said, it will. It's going to be on the Irish American Heritage Museum's YouTube channel and I will put it on our Facebook page and website as well but you know if you have access to YouTube just Google Irish American Heritage Museum and we'll come up on that so if anybody else had any questions I'm just going to look through the the feed there was a lot of comments because other people had family too so John Casey says yay for Ballygawley some of my own maternal ancestors emigrated from there Ah. And, mm -hmm. and then the Monaghans, he said, were his family too. And then Pat Monaghan said, I am a Monaghan, but I have no idea where they're from. Edward was a weaver who came to Taunton and then to Will Willimantic. It's a trade company. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Taunton is a couple of miles from Providence and Willimantic is maybe 40 miles from Providence. Oh. And um, uh, it's a very good chance if he he can get in touch with me through Federal Hill Irish and um, he will uh i can help him out and see if he was part of the chain migration great and meanwhile yeah. meanwhile you're looking at some scenes from uh, the south of france i'm sorry <laughs> yeah no don't worry i'm going to do something that i hope i can uh oh god where's it gone ray here you are okay i so anyway um sorry i'm going to go back into the questions there was another couple of ones um okay there was ah. another couple of, i'll just do that so that it you know, stops distracting people with beautiful. Uh, I was looking at the staircase; it was gorgeous. <laughs> um, so I, I'm no, as bad myself. Um, all right. So now, where's my chat gone? Let me go back out to Zoom. Oh Christ. Um, okay, I've. Lo uh, so somebody else had asked. Um, chat here it is. Sorry. How long a period did that secular violence that you mentioned last for? I presume that's the no nothing period, you know, that the, the John is asking about that. Uh, well, the if you're in Ireland, um, you can find a lot of examples in the early 1800s of um, attacks going back and forth between Protestants and Catholics. Um, and of course, the um, the Orange Order would have their their parades every year, and they were basically designed to instigate fighting. Ah. Look at that. Yeah, because I, I was able to stop sharing mine then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the, the uh, no nothings happened. It happened in 1854 and it died out pretty quickly. There were other issues that were affecting the United States that were much bigger. Um, the Civil War was on its way. And um, so uh, the no nothings lost out. I mean, they, yeah. they were they were a group of people that didn't have a um, agenda other than an anti agenda mm -hmm. all they could do is complain about what was not right they mm -hmm. couldn't they couldn't promote promote anything that was good mm -hmm. um well, they plus, had some election plus america, america needed those those workers yeah they were desperate they they didn't want them in their towns right but yeah. they had to have them because they, they were factory workers yeah and i mean there they did have electoral success even in new york it was we had a new york you know mayor who was yeah, yeah. a, a know-nothing, you know, so um, it, it was kind of, you know, from the 1820s on, they start burning, you know, convents in Boston and Philadelphia, but um, as you say, it was relatively short-lived, and I think, I definitely think the, the Civil War did a lot to kind of ameliorate the reputation of the Irish, you know, because they had sacrificed so much, supposedly, for the Union, you know. It, it, um, didn't, it didn't do away with it enough that when, oh, my, no, yeah. when my father was growing up and he was born in 1923, he was told there were certain jobs he couldn't have yeah. because he was Irish Catholic. Oh, well, like when Al Smith runs for president, you know, the KKK is reformed to run against, you know, to, to yeah. argue against electing him. So and absolutely even Kennedy is asked about his Catholicism in the 60s, you know, and so it, it is. I mean, it, it didn't go away. Um, Norma Coleman says, yay for the Devlins, the Colemans and the Conlins. Where was that reform school that you mentioned in Providence? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Mm. There was a um, reform school over in, near um, India Point, mm -hmm. um, which you will not know about, but he may know about. Um, and I think that might have been it. Um, 
I'm pretty sure that's where it was. I know at one point they did have the reform school there. They may have moved it to another location. Okay. And if he writes to me, I can, I'll find that out. Norma. Yeah. So do you hear that, Norma? We'll flash up the email again at the end uh, to show you, or I'll, I'll, we'll mention your website, um, Ray. So Pat Monahan said that Edward Monahan, the son, died in Providence in 1861. He was a cabinet maker. I, I think they were talking about her, her own family there. Um, how, yeah, we talked about that. My Keenan and Finnegan ancestor came from Bally Bay to Paw Tuckett in the 1880s and worked in textiles. Could you speak a little bit about that trade in the 1880s and 1890s? Um, I can. First off, I'll say that Bally Bay, um, which is south of um, uh, the area that I'm talking about, but not by much, maybe 20 miles, maybe not less than 20 miles south of, of Emmy Vale. It's south of, of Monaghan Town. Um, quite a few people came from Bally Bay. Mm. Um, they, they originally came to Providence, but they also came to some of the, the towns um, just south of there in what was at the time Warwick and now is West Warwick. Um, the wealthiest immigrant to ever come out of Ireland was a fellow named Joseph Bannigan, and he came from Bally Bay. He was born in, I think, 1846, mm. and he was, became the president of United, United States Rubber. I mean, he became very, very wealthy man. Um, the textiles in the 1880s was a continuation by the 1840s. They were, um, uh, they were employing women and children and they were still doing it in the 1880s. Um, it, it, the early 20th century, they were still trying to find out about um, uh, child labor. Those photographs I showed you of all those little boys and girls working um, they were all under age, and they, those pictures were taken between 1909 and 1912. Mm -hmm. So it was brutal. They worked mm -hmm. long days. Originally, they worked about 14 hours a day with um, half of that on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, there was a terrible, terrible uh, disaster in, in Fall River, not too far away from Providence, where um, I think it was a young woman torn to shreds or no she actually she she jumped out a window to commit suicide um just a little girl and um they changed the hours i think from from 12 to 10 for children that's mm -hmm. that was their way of, of compromising. that was the concession yeah so it was, it and like you're talking rough. heavy machinery you know hot water something like here in albany and troy we had you know laundries and steam and, and collar factories a lot of the time it's very horrible chemicals you know that they're working with depending on what you're doing so it, none of it is pleasant you know to work in these factories and, and even in new york city you know the triangle factory fire happens in was it 1912 or 1914 yeah. and it's not until then you know that some of the conditions for factories change in new york state so well they like exactly. little children to work because for a couple of reasons one hands. is they were obedient <laughs> another yeah. is that if they cause trouble they'd fire the whole family yeah. but also as you point out they had little fingers and if things were caught in the machines they could pull them out yeah. there was a girl named maria fox who um got her hand caught in the machinery she was 10 years old and the finger was pulled off yeah. and they brought her back to the house and told her father to come home that he was she was there and it was, it was pretty brutal stuff and like you might get a few dollars compensation if you were lucky but there isn't you know workers comp really unless you were in one of the unions like the knights of labor or you know those kinds of things it, it's mm -hmm. horrific yeah not much in compensation yeah no 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 compensation really um i was going to say something else there about the factories it might come back to me so norma says my grandparents coleman or conlon um came from Ard boy on loch Ney. are you aware of any irish from that area of tyrone from where Lockney up near um, in Tyrone. That's what she's from Ard Boy or Ard Bui on Lockney. It's A R D B O E. I don't recognize the name. Do you? Me neither. No, Lockney I know, but mm -hmm. Lockney is 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 Tyrone, right? Yeah. Tyrone and um, up near down in uh, Antrim. Yeah, I guess um, she's just asking if people, anyone came. There were people from that area. It was mm -hmm. it was also an area where there were textile workers. Mm -hmm. and the thing was that initially you have these skilled textile workers coming and then when the famine hits um, and people are desperate all over Ireland to leave, people say to their parish priests or to the leaders in their, their community, where do I go? And they say, well, you know, your cousin's there or, or you know, somebody I know is there. Yeah, and so the chain that's migration. why mm -hmm. once the chain starts, it gets mm -hmm. bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So people came from every county in Ireland to, to Providence, Rhode Island, but they came in particular numbers to, from Ulster because yeah. initially you had the had skill someone. worker. Mm 
-hmm. And then once you get to pass the skill worker, mm -hmm. everybody wants to get out and then they go to where John yeah. was and Barney Oh, was. Sandra has just answered Norway. She said, my husband, Brady and Mallon family were from that area. So there, there must have been those families. Um, a very good question from Theodore. A number of Irish in Providence became coachmen and teamsters. Was that a skill that they brought from Ireland? It's interesting how labor develops, you know. That's a very good question. Yeah. Um, and I can't answer that. Um, I can tell you that a lot of the stonemasons had experience making, um, doing stonework in, in Ireland. Um, my uh, great great grandfather, who, um, oh, I've got show and tell here. This is uh, um, a um, butt hinge. He worked yeah. for the New England Butt Company, kind of a funny name. Um, this is quite heavy. And oh. this was made about the time that he was, he was working there. Wow. Um, they became the biggest producers of butt hinges in the world. Um, he came from a place where they, um, there were some small factories making uh, shovels and things like that. And I suspect that he probably, or someone in his family had uh, got, learned their skills in, in Ireland. And then when he came over, he got hired by the, the same company um, mm -hmm. and there were other mechanics working there. So mm -hmm. it may be that he came with skills or his relatives had skills and then exactly, talked yeah. them into bringing him on. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. If they didn't have skills, like it was very, it's very interesting in America. Like, as you said, Ray, the pockets that come. So like, you know, there's a pocket down in Cork um, that had mining experience and, you know, they would all go to Butte, Montana. Um, yeah. Allahees is the place in Cork. But the other side of that coin was the advantage of the Irish was if you didn't have the skills, you probably knew someone on the job. And so they would be able to kind of get you in, you know, <laughs> so. Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's, so it's very interesting that like, I mean, I'm definitely thinking some of them had skills. And as far um, as being as far as being a teamster, um, you have to realize that back in the day, um, a lot of people knew how to work with horses. Yeah. And a teamster yeah. would have Especially to work with horses. Yeah. Yeah, so if yeah. you came over and became a teamster, you didn't become a teamster unless you had some experience with horses. Yeah. You might have gotten it here or mm -hmm. you might have come with it. Mm hmm. Uh, Sylvia Ann says very fascinating facts, wonderful images. Well done. Um, she says, great, you know, journey from sadness to success. And then she has shared that old article about um, it's a very famous story. You know, there was a an older professor who kind of alleged it, the, the paper he wrote was called The Myth of Victimization. And he said that, you know, Irish people had or Irish Americans had invented this no Irish need apply sign. And basically a kid in high school literally just decided one day to go through the databases of newspapers like and pulled out every ad that literally said no Irish need apply. And I, I mean, it's I don't really know. How, Jensen was his name, Richard Jensen, because I read the article myself in university. And I was like, oh, that's interesting you know and so i think his point was that like teddy kennedy might have misremembered seeing it in his lifetime you know sort of but absolutely this this child goes on to say that you know the signs were ever and I, like we've seen them ourselves in the museum you know women advertising for maids when irish women were ubiquitously working as maids practically and it says you know no irish need apply so yeah, they, they, the, they were shut out at times, you know. The earliest record that I've found in a newspaper, the earliest ad, I think, was in the 18, late 1820s, saying yeah. no, no Irish. But also, I'm working on a, um, a project. There are about uh, 20 of us, or there have been more than that, uh, working on a project with, um, with uh, bank records. And mm. one of the things that I've found is the number of Irish women that worked in houses was huge. So yeah. although there was prejudice against having Irish people, a lot of the uh, the top people, the the governors, the the owners of big companies had Irish people, Irish women yeah. working in their homes. Yeah, absolutely. So and you, you have, know, you have women... both of those things. Yeah. But you also you also find ads that say um, a nice uh, Swedish girl would be good. Yeah. Or, nice, nice or African Americans girl. sometimes they prefer. You know, they just think they're a little bit. There's like there's very interesting primary sources that talk about sometimes how biddable Irish Catholics are, and you know they're they're girls and they're very appreciative of the fact that like they don't entertain company. You know, they won't kind of go courting, but they don't like the fact that Irish Catholic girls are superstitious and clannish and you know. So there's a there's a dichotomy in how they think of Catholic girls. You know, it's um, true. Yeah, I think Catholic. I think that in 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 the case of my family, I think it was my as I said, my great great grandmother made a lot of money. I found that like yeah. she worked for one family for th at least three years. Yeah. She made a lot of money that she sent home. 
for the rest oh, of the family it, over. You know, it was absolutely a windfall for a family because the girl, of course, didn't have to pay rent. You know, she was fed and found. She saved her money. Women, there's no doubt like the Irish women in America sent home more money than the men a lot of the time because they could afford to. Yeah. Um, and they helped build churches. All of these church building campaigns you know, it was Irish maids depositing money for the banks, you know. And if you read, um, Margaret Lynch Brennan has a brilliant book about Irish maids. She kind of wrote the first one, um, Ubiquitous Bridget, the Irish servant girl, and then Hassia Diner and Janet Nolan has written books too. Um, but they all talk about like the upward mobility that comes through the women. And as Ray said, because they're working for, you know, the hoi polloi, they're learning American morals and Ameri like how to set a table and, and, you know, modern American standards of middle class living. And so and, and, and learning and learning the proper accent to have. Yeah. And so their daughters become nuns or teacher or nurses or teachers, you know, like with whereas the men maybe are still blue collar, you know, maybe the father is a plumber or a cop or, you know, and the son might become a plumber or a cop. Um, Catherine has said my father, my husband's father's Irish family went through Canada which a lot of them did because it was particularly during the Great Hunger more expensive to land in New York port, for instance, and then down into upstate New York. His mother's Irish family that they fit a brick wall with, the grandmother was a Reardon and they found nothing about her. We have found main, many relatives in Ireland because of the ancestry DNA stuff, but because she was orphaned as a young child, she didn't know anything about her family. Her DNA connections are specific to Connacht and Munster. How hard is it to find immigration records for those areas? Do you want to take Irish, that break? <laughs> Irish records are tough. Irish yeah, records are tough. they are. The um, other two groups that are very hard are East European Jews and African Americans. Mm -hmm. um, very, very tough on the records. Like there are parish records and stuff online now from Ireland. Um, we have a genealogist who comes in once a month to the museum. So if you're ever in Albany, you're welcome to come the last Wednesday of every month she comes. Um, it, it can be hard, as you say, she said, that even going to Ireland was no help for her side. You Because maybe Reardon was not her name. You know, like if she was yeah. adopted, maybe she was given another name or, and I'm not a genealogist, but I like I hear our genealogist all the time saying, if you can find the record of entry, that will help you go backwards then to Ireland, you know, and you got to find, she calls it the fan club. There's family and neighbors and, you know, like maybe I'm the cousin and so I appear at the wedding. Maybe I'm a godmother mm. to the kids. So like you'll see the same names associated again yeah. and again, and that helps you to prove, you know. Um, the records in Ireland, as far as church records go, um, are very slender Scatty. before 1840. And yeah. even after that, they're, they're, they're broken up. Um, yeah. And there are no census records that exist before 1901. Yeah. Um, and now, so, actually, they're restructuring those uh, archives. Well, they, they <laughs> are. They, are. Yeah. they yeah. are. They're they're exceptions, and they're putting some stuff together. Um, yeah. The reason I know that my uh, ancestor um, um, Frank Stroker um, threw out his his daughter or didn't have his daughter living with him is that um, I found a copy of the 1851 census in which it listed who was in his household, mm -hmm. and at the time. His daughter, my my ancestor, would have been fourteen, and she wasn't living at home, mm -hmm. and so it made wow. sense that that yeah. she would have been sent to a, to relatives because that's what you did not only in the Irish community but in other communities. Yeah, um, a man's wife died, and you he sent the kids somewhere else yeah, to an absolutely. aunt or a cousin, and then yeah. he started a new family. Yeah, and as you said, so, Ray, like when they're dying on the boat, you know, like you could get off the boat parentless. And so a neighbor is going to take you in or, you know, Tyler Anbinder has written a, an article about the famine um, five points. I, I think I don't mm -hmm. know if I see you reference it, but very good. And it's through the bank records. The, those immigrant savings bank records are online through the New York Public Library, I think. And we just had Lisa give a talk last week. It's actually on our YouTube page. She talked about the immigrant savings banks and um, the foresters they were out of Massachusetts. It was kind of an insurance insurance um, company. Yeah. Yeah. And so she was saying like you sometimes have to think outside the box when you're looking for records because the foresters, for instance, like had, you know, um, the worker and then who would inherit the thing. And, you know, it was and the, sometimes the, information about their parents in Ireland. It was very interesting. Yeah. The the, the pr project we're working on in Rhode Island is um, several hundred thousand uh, records between 1844 and 1897, mm -hmm. and they can be very intimate. 
Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. it, or they can sometimes they just nothing there, but they, mm -hmm. they can really have a lot of detail. And mm -hmm. we've got about 2000 records up online on my on my my blog right now. Oh, but gosh. I'm guessing there's going to be over 200,000 records when we're all said and done. That's and they, what they, do you give, see? What's they your give blog very again, specific right? information. Hmm? What's your blog again? I just want to type it. Federal Hill Irish. Federal Hill. Yeah, I couldn't remember. Federal Hill Irish. <laughs> Um, is the blog. Betty says, thank you very much. Fascinating um, chronology and family history. And we just had a, an interesting question from Robert. He says, the Irish were the only dirty Europeans. If they prefer Swedish or African maids, what is this based on? It wasn't like dirt. It was the Catholic thing was the big one. You know, the Catholic thing was the, Catholic yeah. thing was the biggest thing. Um, in the 1850s and 60s, um, the Irish, at least in Providence, made up vast majority, probably 80 or 90% of the immigrants. Um, there were uh, small groups of Scandinavians. They were the beginnings of um, East European Jews. Um, mm -hmm. There were a few Germans. If you go down to New York, you find a large German population. I think Philadelphia had a fairly large German population, but mm -hmm. the Germans didn't come to Providence. Um, and then later on in the 1880s and 90s, you've got a big Italian population. The roots of them is in the 1830s and 40s. You know, they, they plant little seeds. It takes a few decades, and then the the big onslaught comes. Yeah. Well, and I just I'm going to show you guys um, one of the like there's there are famous cartoons about the maids, and the, I just, this is just something we did for another talk. But like <clears throat> this one in the middle. So it wasn't, you know, that they were dirty, but they were seen sometimes or, or certainly portrayed in, in popular media. Louisa May Alcott wrote a really scathing article one time about like, um, I can't remember what the exact word, something like the ungovernable nature of the Irish, you know, and, and the faults of her race. But this here, like the Irish Declaration of Independence. So, you know, she's burning the dinner. She's broken a plate. She's ordering the mistress out of the kitchen she's not dressed appropriately you know like the dress is the wrong length she's got shamrocks on her uh on her dress like where's this little you know wasp mistress is the epitome of femininity you know and in reality of course this is what the maids looked like you know but there there was a, a sense even though i was saying that sometimes they thought irish catholic maids were very biddable and very obedient because they were like so faithful to god and things and they were afraid to sin there was also this attitude at the time that they were very opinionated and quite like independent you know and there was an advice book published by the nun of Kenmare for girls who immigrated which told them like you know make sure you get Sunday morning off to go to mass it kind of warned them about protecting themselves from the son or the the master of the house you know because you didn't want to get in trouble um so that you know there's an awareness that these women have networks of communication between each other like they recommend each other for different jobs they tell each other what they're being paid um, you know, like they kind of urge each other that, oh, you can get more money from that family if you move here or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think people were afraid of their perceived independence, you know, and, and they socialized, of course, through the parish. So they were kind of ungovernable in one way, you know. Uh, but it's it's a fascinating story. Those books, Hassia Diner wrote the book called Aaron's Immigrants, uh, Aaron's Daughters in America and Margaret Lynch Brennan, who's from our region here, um, the Irish Servant Girl. Very, very good books. So does anyone else, I better check YouTube in case people are typing there and we've left them out. <laughs> does anyone else have any questions or comments? It was brilliant, you know, Ray, absolutely. Um, so they should look at your blog for information about that specific region. Uh, it is difficult, you know, the ancestry stuff is great because a lot of people are doing this, but as you said, Ray, the, the church or, you know, the records in Ireland are a bit scatty um at times although they are trying to put as many parish like so you you could be lucky and find you know the births and marriages and deaths records you know uh but you'd need to know I, your I parish. i've been lucky enough to give an example on one end i've been lucky enough to be in the home of my third great grandfather mm -hmm. in roscommon to walk mm -hmm. the farmland of my third great grandparent yeah. in monaghan but i also have two branches um, Mullen and Fanning, and I don't know where they come from. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can have so much luck and dig down and find it, um, 
or you're you can be stuck out there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's um i mean the yeah. fact that i found that um uh, uh, mary mclaughlin was from county mayo showed mm -hmm. up in a bank account a bank mm -hmm. record if we hadn't started transcribing those things i would never have known there's mm -hmm. nowhere else that, mm -hmm. that it lists mm -hmm. um and, and like spelling is not standardized and you know you have to remember people are handwriting so you could say like i would say mclaughlin you know and that might change how they would spell the name instead of you know, and so you think you're looking for a name that might be slightly wrong or they might have added an o or dropped an o or a mac you know so um it's it's a terrible i pity all genealogists you know because <laughs> I, like it would wreck my head you know like looking for these kind of needles in haystacks but there are um we will have actually it's online I, I said you know the lisa's talk and our genealogist has given a number of talks but ray that's a really good insight like these and you know what's another brilliant source too sorry is like the pension files from the civil war um era yes. because sometimes sometimes it's the family in ireland that are claiming on behalf of their dead son or like the widow you know so the guy might be dead but someone is writing and you know and they have to kind of provide knowledge of who they are and all of that you know so so you can sometimes even if you knew that your soldier ancestor was alive something in his records might indicate like my mother is living in ireland and then you can go That's back true. there because now you have that name for the first time ever you know so um there's ways to do it you there's a very good source <laughs> there's a very good source source it's uh i think it's irish ancestors john yeah. grenham john grenham has um, put together documents from the 19th century and if you want to find out where your family comes from like this uh, mary mclaughlin her original name was hoban mm -hmm. and he helped me dial it down to a very small area near uh, westport um in other cases, if your name is McCarthy or your name is Kelly, you're not you're never going to do that. Yeah. But if you if your name is unusual, um, uh, John Grenham is a really good source. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, Theodore said that in the early city directories. Oh yeah, that's a good source too, mind you, for American. You can see that the editors struggle with the spelling, yeah, of the Irish surnames. They absolutely do, you know. And uh, and again, some of them might be the same. You know, it might be five McLaughlins together and they'll all be spelled differently, even though it's the one family, you know, because, Absolutely. you know, so it's hard. So I was just typing in the chat for everybody that Beyond 22 is the name of the new virtual archive in Ireland. So, you know, Ray was alluding to the they burned the the records, the public records office during the um, civil war in Ireland in 1922. And of course, that we lost a lot of records, you know, at that time. We've lost other records other times and church records have been mysteriously vanishing over the centuries because of floods and fire so that archive is they have literally gotten copies of things that were sent to america or sent to you know the british government to keep and so you will be able to search irish records in the next year or two they're launching it this year on beyond 22. you know elizabeth um, i am going to have to go this is yeah. this has been great but i've got to yeah. leave no problem <laughs> there's no more questions anyway i don't think from anyone so thank you so much thank you ray Suzanne, and and yeah thank you guys everyone so thank you very much ray and we'll have you back and i've put his blog online and, and he's contactable <laughs> thanks elizabeth okay take care bye 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 bye